to the complete ready, we're going to be looking at a lot of different lines for white, and there's a good bit of variance in these. So when studying, you're going to want to play around with the positions a lot and make sure that you understand when and when you can't reach your ideal position. So keep in mind that this repertoire can be played starting with either d4 or knight f3. So let's start off going with d4, and we're going to look at first the ideal position of what you're going for. So say we're going to fianchetto our bishop, we want to castle, play b3, then bishop b2, then knight d2, then c4, and here is our position that we're striving to get, but we aren't always going to be able to reach this ideal position. This is the position that you want to have in your mind in most cases. So this video is about showing you the exceptions of when you cannot get to this position. You can get to this position quite a lot, but you need to know the little variances. So, going back to move one, so we have d4, d5, knight f3, and what if he plays c5? Now, any time they are threatening the d-pawn with the c-pawn, we need to focus on specific answers for it. In this case, in this one particular situation, you take on c5. And now when he plays e6, you have the very surprising but strong move e4. And there's really no good way for black to handle this position. Say if he takes, we trade queens, and then we have the very strong move knight g5, which attacks both the f-pawn and the e-pawn. So when black comes back to defend, we have knight takes, and if f5, we have the very annoying move, knight d6 check. And we can continue to be annoying to black as he's trying to get that pawn back, but black just has a busted position at this point. So that's the first variation. So now let's talk about something that you won't see very often, but you still need to be aware of it. c5. Now, like I said, the c5 move is something that black will do in order to try to throw you off from the ideas of our ideal position. So for instance, if you play the move knight f3, which looks normal enough here, this is bad because after takes, takes, our pieces can get kicked around and we don't want in the opening for our pieces to get mowed around the board. So after c5, we play the move d5, gaining space. After knight f6, g3, e6, we're happy to take and give black the space because we can immediately start trying to tear him down. Now, I am not worried at all about him taking here because this is a lost in-game position. He can't move a pawn or a piece to defend this weak pawn. So if he gives it up, he just messes up our structure, but we got our pawn back, and we've got decent play. The fact that black skin can't castle, and we have quick and easy development, like putting the bishop on g5, putting the rook on d1, putting the knight on c4, and this knight has options to go to h3 and then f4 and castles. Going overboard with the arrows is a lot of fun. I mean, you just got to put your pieces where they go. What's the problem with that? Just do it. So... Hopefully that line made some sense, so let's roll it back after c4. Typically a guy's going to play d4. He's not going to mess up his structure for you and make it easy. Knight f3 to start attacking his space. He defends it. e3, if he takes, we're taking his queen. So usually they're going to do that. We take, take, and after castles, we're going to try to use the open file, put our pieces on decent squares, and we're good to go. Now, the only reason we put the bishop on f4 instead of b2 in this situation, we don't want the bishop looking at this very, very well-defended pawn that there's really not much we can do about. So we find a different avenue for the bishop to work with for us. So, next up, let's go to the little scene, Dutch defense, f5. And after knight f3, knight f6, g3, there are three different Dutch variations, each of which we can get our structure, our ideal structure. So say after g6, this is the Leningrad Dutch, all the moves look natural. 
The only thing that you need to remember is that black is playing for the move e5, and we must stop it. So after bishop b2, he needs one more move in order to really start making queen, or e5 a threat. He plays queen e8 or knight c6. Either of these is met by the move d5 in order to stop him from playing e5. After c6, he's trying to get us to move this pawn so he can play e5. So we support it. And after knight bd7, we have the very strong move knight d4, threatening knight e6. And next we can play knight c3 or knight e6, and we will complete development. So that covers the Leningrad Dutch. Now let's roll it back and look at the next Dutch variation. This is the Stonewall Dutch. And it's hence named because we will see... Instead of bishop d6, the move order they could use to really emphasize what the stone wall looks like, it's this structure is, is the stone wall. In this game, black decided to play bishop d6, and after b3, the best minor piece in the stone wall is this bishop, because it points directly at our king, and it agrees with all of these pawns, and this bishop is going to be the bad bishop that is locked behind the pawns and can't get out. So typically... If you can trade this bishop for this one, you're doing a great job versus the stone wall. So after queen e7, we were going to trade our bishop on a3. So now you need to find a move to be able to trade the bishop on a3. So pause your video and figure out a plan of how you can get that trade. Okay, so if you found the move a4 with the idea of getting the rook involved in defending that square again, excellent move. So after c6, bishop a3, there's no way for him to stop the trades. And then we're going to have great play with c4, queen b1, b4. And we're just rolling pawns on the queen side and using that great space that we have. So let's go back and cover the last variation of the Dutch called the classical. And we're going to play our same moves. But the key this time is black. He's being sneaky here. He's going to swing this queen over here, and he's going to try to put the knight here, and he's going to try to mate you. I'm not a big fan of getting checkmated, especially when I have white. So let's go ahead, and I'll show you exactly how you can bust this idea. e3, very important. And when he plays queen h5, we have the extremely strong move, knight fd2. And this is counterintuitive because you're taking a defender away from your king. But the thing is... I'm offering a trade of queens. You want to trade? If he plays knight g4, just h3. And when he goes away, we get our queen trade and we have a better position. Now keep in mind that if black is getting aggressive here, he plays queen h6. I'm just going to prevent you from going to g4 and I'm not going to have any problems. I'm, I'm not worried about anything at all here. So okay, let's now go to some of these variations we're going to see on a regular basis. After d4, we see g6, knight f3, and the first variation I'm going to show you here, this is a Grunfeld. It's a symmetrical position, and there we go getting our ideal position again with bishop b2. Like, get the structure in your head. I mean, just get it in there. Nice arrows. Okay, so after bishop f5, knight d2, we got our typical move c4, and we got a classic Grunfeld. All right, now let's roll it back a bit to this position. If they play d6, now if we play our typical structure with b3, we get a bad position. Now let me show you why. After he plays this, a lot like the Leningrad, we want to prevent e5, but d5 doesn't work like it does in the Leningrad. So after bishop b2, we, we have momentarily prevented e5. But after he plays rook e8, there's no way for us to add any more pressure here. So after c4, e5, and in fact, black has a very nice move here in knight g4, working this pin, and black ends up getting a very, very nice position quickly. So that's why we can't play b3 against the king's Indian. So the move that I'm recommending for you, which is very annoying to a king's Indian player, rook e1. And the idea is very simple. I want to play e4 and just not let you have a king's Indian. We're transposing into a weird Pyrrhic variation. So 
After knight bd7, he wants to play e5, uh, play e4. And do note that if he played bishop f5 to try to stop e4, I'm not too worried about it because I can be annoying with that move. And now I'm threatening this pawn and then winning it, winning the rook. So keep that little idea in mind. Very important. After knight bd7, e4. And after e5, knight c3. And I just got everybody on great squares. This is nice. I'm going to put the pawn there and say if he makes a move like a5, I can play bishop f4, and after knight c5, let's count. He's got one, two, three guys, but I got one, two, three guys, which means we're completely okay there, but the problem is, he can't ever really move that guy. This guy's having problems moving, so it's very easy, like, let me make a null move for black. After, or after knight c5, I'm going to play knight d to b5, and... He can't ever touch this pawn, because that one will hang. And he can't ever really move this pawn. And this is just a, a tedious type position for black to play. I'm going to put the queen there on d2, and put my rook on d1. And this is just overall a really easy and great position to play. Now, we've only got one more line, and this is going along with these early c5 ideas. So coming back to this position, what if he plays c5 here? Before, I told you, only in this position do we take. Now, if he plays c5 on move 1, we play d5. But what about with this position? If we take, that's crap, because we give him free development. If we push, that's garbage, because he's getting a free pawn. So, in this situation, unlike the first one that I showed you, we allow him to be able to take here because he's not going to push this pawn again and kick our knight around. He's going to waste time doing that. So you just play bishop g2. And when he takes, takes. Usually you'll see a move like d5. We castle. Take. And we have this nice move c4. We're always trying to attack a center when it's created. If he moves the pawn, we have bishop takes c6, forking the king and rook. So he can't really move this guy at all. So after bishop e7, look at that. We're getting our structure again. We just don't have the knight on f3. After castles, knight d2. And there we have our structure, albeit missing the knight. So to recall what we're going for, we want the ideal structure, but make sure when going through the videos, or the lines rather, that you are definitely understanding why certain moves are played instead of the main line getting this position every time you play. Now hopefully you enjoyed the ready video. There's more to come.